Welcome back, guys, to the Great Ace Attorney Adventures, where last episode, Rionosuke lashed on to the fact that Mr. Graydon knew that the peephole existed when he should have no knowledge of it, revealing a deal made between Graydon and Gregson centered around the missing music box disc that completes the stolen government secret set, and then deducing that Gregson palmed the disc off on Nash Skulking when it came down to finding it. However, with neither party willing to admit to this, one due to self-incrimination and the other due to having to keep things hush-hush, on order of the government, we now look to force Gregson to doing the right thing in a bid to save Gina from a guilty verdict. With that said, the only link we have to the deal is literally the information itself. And the information itself is delivered through this strange music box. So we present. Take that! Is that... Mr. McGilder's Peculiar Music Box Council? Yes, with a disc already in place, ready to play. I think perhaps now would be a good time to listen to the sound produced by the music box again. Only this time... With the second disc we've just discovered set in place as well. Pure blackmail. Can't let those secrets go out, can ya? Goodness, this disc council... No! Wait! Uh, I can't let you do that! Why not? B because um, well... Because it's got nothing to do with this case! That's why! Objection! Not true, Inspector! Eh? Uh. The defense has already proposed that the sounds heard by the court earlier from this music box were part of a Morse code message. We know that Morse code comprises of two distinct tones. The defense believes that the second disc contains the second tone needed to complete the message. And now we have a chance to confirm that theory. We're crying out loud, sunshine. We're talking about state secrets here. Have you got to let an old courtroom hear confidential information like that? It's, it's treason. Then do you admit the charge? And in order to protect those state secrets, you engage in unlawful dealings with the witness. You're, you're mad. If you let that secret information out to the public domain, you'll, you'll be making an enemy of the entire British government, you know. Objection. Let's not forget, Inspector, that you, a Scotland Yard officer, leaked confidential case details to a witness. That you continue to lie in court, and all because, by fair means or foul, you're determined to do your duty. Well, by fair means or foul, I'm prepared to do mine. Don't you dare... I will stop at nothing to protect my clients. I don't care who I make an enemy of. My lord, if you please, the court must hear the sounds made by that music box. Come on, Van Zeeks, for Pete's sake, stop him! Objection! Inspector, you should know my methods by now. I'm a prosecutor. I'm no Scotland Yard puppet. Ah! In this courtroom, my duty is to the law, so let me propose a toast to uncovering the truth, by fair means or foul. No! Very well. The defense stands here, and that of the prosecution has been made very clear, I feel. Therefore, in accordance with the defense's request, the court will now listen as this music box is set in operation once more. Buckle, Gregson. This time, with the second disc in place and both discs playing simultaneously. Buckle. You don't really want it to be played, don't you? Just admit it. Wait, really? Oh, listen to that. It's... it's unmistakable now. It's Morse code. Alright, alright, I admit it. Whatever you want. But for the love of God, shut that blooming box up! Let me ask you again then, Inspector Gregson. Did you, or did you not, strike a deal with a witness next to you in the stand, Mr. Ashley Graydon? 
Specifically, did you furnish the witness with confidential case details in exchange for this music box disc? Did you reveal the existence of the peephole in the pawnbroker's storeroom door, Inspector? I did. Stop! What are you doing, man? It's all exactly like the young Eastern lawyer said. When the trial resumed after the recess and we were stood here in the stand together, that's when he approached me with a deal. Shut up, you imbecile. Shut up! Psst, you there. You're the detective who turned up at the pawnbroker the other day, aren't you? I may have something you're looking for, Inspector, with me at this very moment. So how about a trade I suggest you accept? Or information that may make certain individuals uncomfortable will soon become very public indeed. I couldn't let that information become public knowledge, not under any circumstances. So I accepted the man's proposal and told him details about the case that should have put him in the clear. The people on the storeroom door and the bloodstains on the overcoat. By giving false testimony, this witness intended to have the defendant wrongly accused of murder. Inspector, you knew that. Yet you still revealed those details to facilitate the witness's perjury. I did. But then it turned out the people had only been made that night after the incident took place. Scotland Yard wasn't aware of that, if I'm perfectly honest. Well, Mr. Graydon, what do you have to say for yourself? Ugh. Ugh. There's nothing and no one left you to hide behind. You struck a deal with the inspector in order to escape conviction of a very serious crime. Namely this. You are the third intruder who broke into the pawn brokery on the night in question. And you perpetrated the murder of the proprietor, Mr. Pop Windebank. Ah! You! You! Traitor! Someone help him, he's a cop. A bailiff! A bailiff! Restrain that man! At once! That's it then. It's all over. Breathe. I despise my life growing up. Those slums are vile places. I was cursed from birth, born into poverty, the son of a penniless artisan. My parents did nothing but quarrel all day long. What little money they had was never spent on me. So I set about studying to better myself, to one day escape from that hellhole. And you eventually became a communications officer. I admire your determination. But then you decided to try to sell government secrets. Why? Isn't it obvious? Because I wanted money. Even now, years later, the nightmares of my life in the slums wake me in the small hours. I wanted to drown them out with more money than anyone who lived in that squalor could ever imagine. Then one day, I met him. Mr. Magnus McGilded. You're a theme of his queer talent, so you are. I have money to throw you away if you're interested. All you need to do is go along with me little plan now. I was to steal the Ministry's telegraphic message logs and McGilded would buy them for a handsome sum. As I was responsible for inspections of the Ministry's communications office, it was a simple enough task. The lure of the devil's offerings, how easy it is to succumb. But you must surely have realized the seriousness of the crime you were committing. And for that reason, I took great lengths to ensure that my actions were untraceable. By using the music box. My father was a brickmaker. Though my mother divorced him when I was still a child. Yes, Mr. Mason Milverton. That's right. He was very skilled with his hands. He'd once been a music box maker's apprentice. I imagine his skills would be sufficient to create a machine that could generate Morse code. 
So I sought out my father again to employ his services. It was the first time I'd seen him since I left the slums ten years earlier. Look at you, Ashley. What a fine gent you've become, eh? He was a different man to the one in my memory. A thin, frail old man. The poverty had never broken him. Never corrupted him like it had me. I was sure that he wouldn't help me if I told him the real reason. So I made up a story. I got some work for you, father. I need some music box discs made. Music box disc, eh? A music friend of mine has written some music he wants to sell to the public. I've brought the score with me. There are two, actually. I'd be delighted, son. It's been 20 years since I did any work like this, though. Fetch my tools, would ya? They're in the loft. That's how I had him make the two discs. Thereby splitting the information in two. You were taking considerable precautions indeed. It was to protect myself as much as anything. It meant that I could deal with McGilded in two separate transactions. The first involved the first of the two discs and the music box for playing them. I exchanged with McGilded for ten guineas. Then on receipt of the second disc, he would pay a thousand guineas. So, what happened on the omnibus two months ago? Was the second part of a deal? The exchange of the second disc? Yes. I sold the man information that way a number of times already. But it seems he became reluctant to part with his money. But that doesn't quite make sense, Mr. Graydon. Or why was it that on the omnibus two months ago, your father, Mr. Milverton, was the one dealing with Mr. McGillard and not yourself? When I received the thousand guineas after my first completed dealings with McGillard, I decided to give 200 to my father for his troubles. My father realized something was amiss. In time, he worked out that I must be involved in something dubious, and when he did, he said to me, Next time there's an exchange, you'll let your old man do it, understand? Otherwise, I won't take your money anymore. That was my father's way of dealing with it, I suppose. Climb into the omnibus, hand over the second disc, and take the money from the gilded. That's it. He had no idea what was actually on the discs I'd asked him to make. He never knew. Just like I'll never know why everything went so horribly wrong that night. All I know is that the disc was taken from him, and he never returned home. It was only then that I found out what sort of a monster McGilded really was. So after ten years of not once uttering it, I swore my father's name. To exact revenge. Revenge! As anyone with even the remotest knowledge of the man will no doubt be able to imagine, McGilded brought all his wealth and influence to bear in the most despicable of ways. To crush any semblance of justice in his trial. The crime scene was tampered with, evidence was fixed, and witnesses were bribed. That trial two months ago was a farce from start to finish. My feet had barely touched British soil back then. I walked into that hornet's nest completely unaware of the sinister background to it all. I'd made plenty of money out of my dealings with McGillard by then, so I spared nothing in my arrangements two months ago. I knew exactly who to hire. If you're willing to pay the price, there are people in the city willing to do anything you ask. McGillard himself had shown me that. Ah, uh, are you saying that... I think you have the picture now. After he twisted everything to his favor in this courtroom to ensure that he walked free. I took matters into my own hands and delivered the justice that monster deserved. That tragic accident following the trial here two months ago was planned and executed by yours truly. We killed his death that day. It was caused by this man. Everything is ready, sir. If you'd like to follow me into the courtroom. What's this, officer? Just sooner than I was led to believe. I hope it's no inconvenience, sir. There were some changes to the schedule. Well, I must be making tracks now. It's time for the inspection. They're going to examine the omnibus again, so I'm told. 
asked if I could be present for it myself. Yes, his voice is odd, changeable. So that policeman who came to tell McGill did he could examine the omnibus again. That's right, an imposter hired by me. McGill did use his wealth to manipulate the trial. He paid people to uh, adulterate the omnibus with all manner of false evidence. He threatened witnesses to lie in their testimony. So I gave the man a taste of his own medicine. Once the omnibus was doused in paraffin, one of my sham policemen ushered McGillard inside and sent him on a one-way journey to hell. An eye for an eye. That's how I avenged my father's death. A spine-chilling account indeed. But that wasn't the end of it for me. There was a loose end, you see. A loose end? Yes, I should think it's obvious. The second disc, which my father had taken to exchange with McGill did. Ah, yes. There was indeed no mention of it in the man's trial two months ago. Clearly because it had been removed from the scene of the crime. When I realized it was missing, I remembered something. Something from the first time I dealt with McGilded. This is the first of the two discs in the music box you need to play them. Oh, look at that now! What an ingenious little invention! So then, as promised, ten guineas for you, young man. What's this? Winnipeg's pawn brokery? Ah, it is a pawnbroker's ticket, so it is. You can use it to redeem an article I've deposited there for ye. There's no need to give a name. Just hand over the ticket and tell the fee in the watchword. I'll put a jewel in pawn for ye. I'll, it'll fetch a good ten guineas if you sell it so, Will. I've never heard of a pawnbroker being used in quite that way before. Have you not, Mr. Graydon? None of pawnbroker is a very useful place, as you know. Each one is like an extremely secure vault. So I knew that if he'd taken steps to hide the disc, it would be in that pawnbroker somewhere. And that on the night he killed my father, he must have entrusted the ticket to someone. Yes, to Gina. I remember now, that when we first met you at Windybanks that afternoon two days ago, you had a description of Mr. Stard written down. How did you know who you were looking for? From the trial, that pickpocket's testimony was clearly peculiar. Anyone could see that. I realized immediately, the, immediately that she was another of McGilded's pawns, and he must have threatened her somehow. I was fairly convinced it would be her who had the ticket, so I started to make some inquiries. I had a strong suspicion the girl would come out of the woodwork on the redemption deadline. And he was absolutely right. And yes, sure enough, she did. All I needed to do was to wait until the girl went to Winterbanks to redeem the articles. But unfortunately, she redeemed only McGilda's overcoat and the one disc that was in his pocket. The all-important music box with the second disc inside was missing. Because it had already been forfeited two days earlier. But I was unaware of that fact. Had I not been, I could have avoided my nighttime excursion. Meanwhile, as our investigation in the stolen government secrets was progressing, we picked up on the fact that McGilda was involved. Inspector, you've recovered fast. Boulders would have recovered the stolen information as quickly as possible. We started gathering the fellow's possessions and examining whatever we could lay our hands on. We had a full-scale investigation going on in the yard, but we had to keep it as quiet as we could. But then, when the inspector here took the disc from me in the pawnbrokery that day, I became nervous. I was sure the music box and the second disc were still there in the shop somewhere. So I knew that it was a race against time. I had to find those articles before the police did. So that's what prompted you to break into the place that same night. With the help of your old friends, the Skulkin Brothers. What happened that night in the pawnbrokery? I can only describe as a nightmare. While Nash and Ringo were searching the counter, I had located the music box I'd sold to McGilded on the shelves of forfeited articles. And the second disc was inside. Yes, 
I slipped it into my pocket with a very deep sigh of relief. But then, something entirely unexpected happened. What are you doing in my shop? A gunshot rang out in the shop and I felt a sharp pain in my left arm. The broker fired his gun and the bullet pierced your limb. Yes, exactly. But unfortunately, I decided to bring my own gun with me that night, just in case. Before I knew what was happening, I'd fired back. The man had already turned to flee. I had intended to fire in his direction, much less kill him. But unfortunately for both of us, the bullet hit home. It struck him in the middle of his back as he fled through the storeroom door for refuge. A sorry, sorry tell. It all took place in the blink of an eye. I don't imagine Nash and Ringo even realized what had happened at first. I was terrified, so I fled. And that's the whole story. That's everything that happened at Windbanks on that wretched night. Earlier, you called McGilded a monster. A man who used his wealth and influence to distort the facts and escape justice for the crime of murder. What tragic irony. For what you have done is exactly the same. You have become the very monster you saw and despised so deeply in McGilded. Yes, I think I have. Well, this has been a long and exhausting trial. However, it would seem that at last we've arrived at the truth. Inspector Gregson, or what of Miss Ashley Graydon? It's been restrained, my lord, and it's been escorted to the yard. They'll be charged with the murder of Mr. Winnebank. And the stealing of government secrets. Very good. And you, Inspector. Regrettably, you will have to face charges yourself. Yes, my lord. Of course. It transpires that you were complicit in helping a criminal escape justice. That fact remains whether or not you were doing so in the line of duty. The crime is a serious one, Inspector. And in and inexcusable. Now to the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. Ah, uh, yeah. It is time for the final adjudication. Is the jury ready, Mr. Foreman? Yes, sir. Guard up, squad, and stand by, sir. This is really it now. The last push, the final call, the finishing whistle. My men are ready to deliver their verdicts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Foreman. Very well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you will now declare your final decisions to the court. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Ha <laughs> ha That's the stuff! I'm off the hook! Finally, Bruno! You finally managed to do it! Finally is the word. I really wasn't sure if we'd come out on top for a while there. Susie was right. You're the best lawyer in the world! Miss Lestrade, I'm not finished with you yet. Eh? What? What are you looking at me like that for? Before you start enjoying your freedom, there are certain other crimes to consider, hmm? Eh? Two months ago, in my courtroom, no less, you gave false testimony, did you not? And in relation to the trial today, not only did you unlawfully enter Winniebank's pawn brokery, you also attempted to abscond with Mr. McGillard's property, it seems. Eh? I never 
done nothing of the sort. Of course not. It's not like you were gleefully wearing McGilded's coat in your cell yesterday or anything. Ah, oh, and just when I was getting excited about throwing a party for Guinea this evening. And turning our attention to the defense. Determining that when played together, the music box disc contained a message in Morse code was... Well, it was certainly a most unexpected revelation, Council. Quite so, my lord. The prosecution was caught entirely off guard. In fact, I think we should applaud my learned friend's courage here today. I propose a toast. To demanding that government secrets be disseminated before the entire courtroom. Ah! But very sorry about that. It was the only way that I could get Inspector Gregson to admit to what he'd done, so... If, if I may say something on that point. Who, 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 who? Isn't that... It's, um, about the sounds produced by the music box before. I do wonder if that was really Morse code at all. What? What are you saying, madam? Oh, well, it's just that I'm really rather fanatical when it comes to Morse code, you see? So much so that the whole world seems to be covered in dots and dashes to me, in fact. A oh, goodness, madam. An unhealthy level of obsession, one feels. But I must say that, in my opinion, the sounds produced by those two discs... We're nothing more than that. A meaningless series of two different tones. What? What? C can that really be? It wasn't Morse code after all. My lord, the defense would like to listen to the music box again. Are you off your nut? How many times do I have to tell you? Those discs contain ministerial secrets and shine. This courtroom is not an appropriate forum to discuss the nature of the government communications. We know McGilded conspired to trade national secrets with our enemies, secrets acquired from Mr. Graydon. Now that the man has admitted to his crimes, we have no need to pursue the matter further. Uh, but it's really going to bother me. Miss Lestrade. Yeah, my lord. That which you have seen today here in this courtroom has been extremely disturbing. Falsified evidence, intimidation, perjury, a grim catalogue of depravity. An appalling experience to befall any child. Come on, it ain't nothing I don't see most days in the back slums. I beg your pardon? If you're weak, you pay for it. That's just how life goes. Gina. But look, I reckon I've worked something out today. The world ain't fair, but if you want it to change... You've got to start at home. You've got to change how you are yourself. Well, that's a very laudable lesson, I would say. I eagerly look forward to the born again Mr. Strad never gracing my courtroom with her presence again. Now, with regard to the murder of Mr. Pop Winniebank, proprietor of a pawnbrokery business on Baker Street, I hereby declare the defendant. Miss Gina Lestrade. Not guilty! Ah, cool firework! That's dangerous. That is all. Court is adjourned. On a personal note, I must say you've surprised me, my far eastern friend. Ah! Oh! Despite being an Nipponese, you saw through the pretense to the malice that festered within that Englishman. And at the same time, saw through the grime to the surprising heart of your English client. You have a curious talent for judging character, especially considering our very different cultures. I don't think there's anything curious about it. Whether we're from the Empire of Great Britain, or the Empire of Japan. 
We're all human beings. We're not so very different on the inside. You know, I took this case for one very simple reason. To lock swords with you once again, here in the courtroom. You did? When I encountered you for the first time two months ago, it reminded me. Of toasting friendship and trust with another Nipponese, only to find my trust betrayed. Through you, I hope to look into the eyes of the man I once knew, and try to understand. You mentioned something similar earlier today, about total betrayal at the hands of the Japanese. What happened exactly? Well, you may ask, and one day, when the time comes, you will learn the answer, whether you like it or not. Alright, then I'll wait for that day if I must. Becoming to be known as the Reaper of the Bailey, and my retirement from service five years ago. It gives me cause to wonder if our meeting has some deeper purpose. So, farewell, my learned Nipponese from fellow. Until we meet again. Until we meet again. Case closed. We have won. And now coming out to the old Baileys, defendants, and to chamber, if I'm right in saying. We end another episode of The Great Ace Attorney. As we're about to engage in all the celebration with Gina out, though, of course, facing multiple charges herself, we check out all the fallout next time as we reach our credits and our end of the game. Hopefully, you'll join me then as we put the main story under wraps with a little bit more to come and a sequel to go. So I'll see you guys next episode for more. Bye-bye.